Hello, my name is Rob and welcome to Directors Uncut. If this is your first episode, we put filmmakers from all corners of the globe onto a huge list that covers everything from acid westerns to silent romances. Then we turn it into a lottery of directors by using a random number generator to pick a name out of the hat, whatever name comes out. I am joined by a rotating cast of guest hosts to discuss them and their work through two films. Uh, today I have been joined by Ariel, who's making her return since, uh, I think it was the Harry Potter and... Uh, yeah, we talked about Alfonso Cuaron last time, so yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's still to this day, it's the most eccentric double bill the podcast has <laughs> ever had. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I mean, I was very happy on one level to be on the Children of Men Rome side because I love both of those films. But when I saw Etumama Tambien and Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban come up, I just thought, yes, that is what Director's Uncut is all about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, it is indeed. Highbrow second... and lowbrow. <laughs> Well, yeah, yes, I guess that's a perfect way of summing it up. But uh, the second voice you heard there was from Graham, uh, the host of this podcast, sister podcast, uh, Pop Screen. Hello there, Graham. Hello there. Yes, that's always weird how it's called sister podcast. It's a weird turn of phrase that I never Definitely got. It's but... a podcast, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is what it is. It is what it is. Um, so today it's a Scandinavian director, um, Anders Thomas Jensen, or Jensen. Um, yeah, I I should be referring to one of the, our host guests, guest hosts today because uh, you have interviewed him, have you not, Ariel? I have, actually. Um, I did a terrible job with the interview <laughs> process, unfortunately. I was supposed to be interviewing both him and Mads Mikkelsen at uh, uh, IFFR Rotterdam, um, hmm. specifically about Writers of Justice. And I thought I was being exceedingly clever and charming in all the ways you could possibly be as a podcast host. And then realized that because I was hearing my voice back in my own ears, I hmm. sounded completely drunk when I played the thing back. <laughs> I thought I was being so charming and so witty. And why wasn't he responding to me? Why did he look at me like I had another head? And then I realized he probably thought I was like high on something. So. <laughs> well, as far as anecdotes, I don't think we can beat that as a, a start, really. <laughs> I guess if you were interviewing Mass Mickelson for another round, you could have passed it off as conceptual, right? Yes, totally conceptual. That was that was me making a commentary on disability and uh, <laughs> my cat totally not getting. Your yeah. cat is lovely. <laughs> so. Um, so generally, I'd ask. This is such a hard question to ask this time because he's not got a wide filmography, which has made its leaps really beyond. Um, Scandinavian cinema. A cat again, there we go. <laughs> that was great. That was just the tail passing in front of the webcam like a shark spin. Beautiful. I'm not trying not to be upstaged by a cat, but you know, <laughs> many people have lost that battle. Um, but Anders Thomas Jensen, where did you, where was the first time you, you were aware of him, um, Graham? Uh, the first time I was aware of him was back when we were doing Cinema Eclectica many years ago, and I can't remember who sent it, but some DVD company sent us uh, a copy of his film Men and Chicken, and I didn't get hold of it. I don't think I was that exercised by it. I think Aidan got it, and when he was reading it out, it was one of those great moments where someone is describing a film and you think, have you like drank a whole bottle of cough syrup or something there's no <laughs> way that this film actually exists i refuse to accept it and for a long time that that was until now in fact that was the only exposure i had to anders thomas jensen hmm it's a great introduction as well that's one of those movies it's kind of one of the running narratives of world cinema isn't it that scandinavian cinema is dry and humorless <laughs> yes and you get a movie like that I'm not, I'm not saying it, but you get a movie like that, which is very, very opposite of yeah. uh, its stance in the world. Um, and the same question to yourself, Ariel. Yeah. Well, for me, it was actually, um, I was introduced to him as uh, in, in After the Wedding. Um, that was the first film that I had actually seen that was related to Anders Thomas Jensen. But then um, Men and Chicken was also for me, like one of those seminal uh, introductions in general. 
Um, After the Wedding is kind of interesting in that it's a film that uh, I believe he only wrote. Um, I don't think he directed, uh, if I'm correct about that. I'm, Suzanne I'm... Beyer, wasn't it, who directed that one? Yeah. Yeah. But I I adore the screenplay for that film. Uh, it was unfortunately remade in an American version to not be anywhere near as interesting. But uh, that was the first time I ever saw something he was attached to in a serious way. Yeah, he has a prolific career as a screenwriter as well, just looking at his, his credits. Yeah, I was going to say as well, he, he seems to have a pretty busy acting career uh, of at least, at least he once did. So, um, oh no, sorry, I'm, I am looking at the wrong th- thing. Yeah, he has acted sometimes, but most of his Twice, credits are, are screenwriting. Yeah. yeah, just to name a few of those, uh, The Dark Tower he had a hand in which I'm not familiar with, uh, Brothers, and uh, The Duchess with um, Keira Knightley. And Mads Mikkelsen as well, I believe, was yeah. in that too. Yeah, he's something of a, of a muse, I guess, as yeah. we will go on to, to find. Mm. Um, so the movies that we're going to be doing today are two, I think it's fair to call them wildly different uh, ends of the spectrum. Um, on one end, we have 2003, it is 2003, I think, um, The Green Butchers. And on the other end, we have 2021's uh, Riders of Justice. So, um, should we tackle it chronologically? I think so, yeah. So, starting with The Green Butchers, who wants to take a stab at the synopsis for this odd little duckling? <laughs> I can do that. I've learned from my mistakes in never preparing a synopsis. I can do that now. Bjarne, du kender godt de elmester, som står nede bagved uh, trællestanden. Dødselfarlig. Mm. Og alle har vist det. Bjarne, hører du overhovedet efter, hvad jeg siger? Bjarne, hvad er det, der sker? Få ham væk. Få ham væk. Få ham til at forsvinde ja, ja. nu. Ja, tænd den ordentligt. Jeg skulle kunne tale med Bjarne Ammerer. Er det her, han er? Det kan jeg desværre ikke udtale om. Er noget andet, jeg kan hjælpe med? Nej! Kommer Bjarne nu? Vil du godt lige være sød og tale ordentligt til mig? Jeg kan ikke tale ordentligt. So it's a film about Sven and Bjarne, uh, two brothers played by Mass Mikkelsen and Nikolai Likas, who are very unsuccessful and very unintelligent butchers uh, who decide to get one over their belligerent boss by starting their own butcher shop. They hit a slight snag when there's an unexpected death of one of their enemies and they decide to get rid of him by putting him in the food and it's Mm. quite it's one of those sort of black comedy premises that is quite well worn isn't it the cannibal butcher shop yeah well it it goes back to the demon street the the barber of demon street doesn't it sweeney todd demon barber of fleet street yes yeah so many different versions of that Mm. And even that goes back to like Titus Andronicus and, you know, feeding, you know, people their own children in a pie. And yes. Oh, wow. And that goes back to mythology too. (laughs) And. Tantalus and Pelops and all of that. So. I mean, strictly in comedy, though, say what you want about the tale of Saturn devouring his own sons. There's not many lols in it. Uh, oh, but, wow. <laughs> but it's priests. Have a little priests. That's such a great song. Yes, we've, we've lost Rob completely, but yeah. I know you, you hate musicals, Rob, but that song is absolutely hilarious. I don't know how to pick it up from that, really. Um, but <laughs> I'll just come right out and say I'm, I quite like this. Um, I was surprised by it because it is one of these things, how do you make a, a comedy out of something so horribly bleak, mm. honestly? And I think the way they've done it, it's not through how other um, comedies might do it, making it sort of splat, yeah, splat stick and gross and disgusting. I think it does it just through the character work and I think there's some great character work um, sort of uh, the chief of which is Mads Mikkelsen's ridiculous haircut 
it's like something off Babylon 5. It's incredible. It is. It is. That's a wonderful <laughs> comparison. And I will I will also say, I think Nikolai Lyakos, you know, the two of them together always work so well in Anders Thomas Jensen films, both in Writers of Justice as well, which we're going to talk about later. But the two of them play off of each other in such a beautiful way. Mm. Um, for those of you who don't know Nikolai Lyakas, he's um, very, very well known in Scandinavia, um, particularly for the Department Q films. And uh, he was on Britannia, um, which is available um, all kinds of places these days, um, and was the lead character in that, um, which is a brilliant TV show if you're ever into, you know, swords and sandals and swearing. So, you know. <laughs> um, but I, I really love this film, uh, but I have, I have some qualms about it when I, when it comes to talking about disability in this film, it's having like yeah. a really interesting conversation about disability. And one thing for me, like as a disabled filmmaker and uh, advocate in general, I always find it interesting when films are talking about disabled lives as expendable, but at the same time having a conversation about it. So it's not just, you know, oh, I'm going to take this character off of life support and this is what that means. Mm. It's, it's actually a conversation that's had throughout the film when the brother of who's also played by Nikolai Lyakos, um, who is a character who is represented as having been brain damaged to begin with, but then goes through a coma after a major uh, car accident uh, that kills half the family. The story here for me is not necessarily about how other people treat Igil, the character that's played here, but how uh, Igil reacts to everyone else. Igil has his own agency and has his own uh, way of interacting with the world. And that for me makes it an acceptable form of portrayal. Although uh, we always prefer to see disabled performers play disabled characters etc mm. but I, there are authentically disabled extras in this film i don't know if you guys noticed that um, i can't but, say i did no but like at the butcher shop a couple of times they show extras who have limb differences or ah. um you know either prosthetic arms or legs and it's very interesting mm. because you never see that in european film that's mm. very rare to see. So somebody was paying attention to disability portrayals big time on this one. That's interesting. I'm, I must admit, I'll put my cards on the table. I think there is a lot that's good about this film, but my my baseline for it is that I just did not find it particularly funny. And uh. by the time it got to uh, that character... I don't think there's anything hateful in it, not by any means, but I, I remember thinking I, I could sort of pick apart what you're trying to do here with disability and putting a disabled character in a comedy, but I don't know if it's going to be worth the reward by that point. It, it did not, it didn't really click with me and it sadly, it didn't click with me before that character became central to the narrative. Mm -hmm. That's a pity. I mean, I think that character, there's more to him than it's just here is tokenist, uh, not tokenist, how can I word this? Here um, is someone we're holding up to mock, which it would be yeah, in yeah, someone else's yeah. hands, I think. Yeah. But yeah. He does have agency, he does have a character arc, and there is a, a conflict there between the two brothers, uh, the two mm. twins. It's, it's not just here is a disabled character, let's mock him. It's here is a disabled character who's got a really fractious relationship with his brother, and that is the story that they're trying to tell there. Yes. Yeah. I don't think either brother is... Well, he has problems too. Mm -hmm. He has very severe problems. I think emotional problems that he has. But I think it manages that sort of line, really. It doesn't insult anybody, I think, which is a very hard thing to do. Um, and casting somebody who is able-bodied to play a disabled character is a, scare, is, is a slimy line. Sometimes it's done badly. Um, I think there was a movie last year from South Korea called Midnight, 
which it's about um, a, a deaf woman. I think it was deaf. It's a while mm-hmm. since I've seen yeah, it. Yeah, she's she's deaf, but she's played by a, a, a an actually hearing woman. Yeah, et she is. And I, I was surprised when I learned that. So mm-hmm. I don't think you can have that same sort of discovery in this, considering it's an actor playing two roles. No, but, no. Um, the same time, I think they've managed it tastefully when they. The, I don't think the movie's really a good taste movie. Which is I was going to say, it's surprising. quite something to be talking about tastefulness in this context. <laughs> yeah, I mean, unless you're doing, you know, some kind of double entendre on taste, <laughs> you know. That marinade, you know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So Mad Mickelson is, is a serious man, isn't he? That's the sort of impression you get from his modern roles. He's a very, very attractive man, and he's a very serious actor. And yet. And, and yet. watching him sweat profusely in this <laughs> was just delightful. Getting to see him be like this really unattractive nerd for once in a while. You know, <laughs> that was yeah. actually really delightful. Yeah, because his character, he seems like he has no sort of social grace whatsoever. I think he just insults everybody and he blames them for things that he did wrong. He, it's, it's an intriguing character. He is, yeah, and I, I can't fault his performance in this. I mean, Mickelson is able to get so much shading out of a character that you can pitch him the same kind of role twice and he'll get two completely different characters out of it. And it's remarkable to think that, you know, he would go on to play another cannibal in, it yeah. would be fair to say, a very different context. Yeah. Mm. It's it's fun that you describe it as cannibal, because it is, it is a cannibal comedy. Mm. But at the same time, it's, it's so far away from the concerns of the movie. It's yeah. never really addressed. And maybe that was part of my issue with it in that I, I recognise that part of the humour in it is that it is playing this ridiculous story in a very sombre way. That's particularly obvious with the score, which is, you know, the exact score that a, a true crime drama mm-hmm. that would use for a story like this. But for me, for that contrast to work, that it just has to be pushed a bit further. It's like... The Green Butchers is kind of a ridiculous story, but I don't know. I've read true crime cases that where stuff like this actually happened. It's it's just not quite silly enough for that joke of taking it very seriously to to land properly with me. It's not the special stuff plotline from series two of League of Gentlemen. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I will say that, you know, if you are looking for someone to play a very serious uh, version of a completely ridiculous role, Mickelson's good at it. I love his reaction to when somebody asks him if he's mad and he just goes, that may be the case, which yeah. is a lovely moment. That is a lovely moment. I, I enjoy that. I also will say, I you know, this is this is my other criticism of the film is the way that it chooses to wrap up everything at the end of the film yeah. in this really, really uh, kind of lazy writing way where Astrid just wanders out to the dock and like mm. there's this implication that everything is all right with the world, even though the last time we saw her, she was screaming, you're both psychopaths. And now <laughs> we're supposed to believe that She's just a okay with that and moving on with life. And we have a beautiful ball joke between Igel and Mads Mikkelsen. And yes, okay. like I don't know. I was confused by that. I wasn't sure whether it was meant to be a fantasy ending or not. But the rest of the film didn't really establish that fantasy was in its bones. So it's meant to be read as reality, and this is actually happening. Which is an odd tone to end on, considering she just called them psychopaths. And, mm. yeah. and she's not, you know, a hundred miles off the mark, isn't no. she? I mean, that that should be the moment at which point the bubble gets popped and you sort of sit and think, oh yeah, I've just sat and sympathised with two people who were murdering people and selling mm-hmm. their meat. But it, it doesn't follow through on that. No, it doesn't follow through on on quite the promise of where you want it to go at that point, and you know, it it chooses a semi serious, optimistic ending, which doesn't mm. quite jive. 
Uh, is it a sympathetic with them though? I'm not sure where it is really. Um, it's a hard stance to take because I don't think it depicts either of them as likable or their plight as do or die. It's it's all really a feed into uh, Sven's ego, to be honest. Um, but I yes, feel like the point. film definitely takes a sympathetic view toward Bjorn's oh, yeah. state of mind because Bjorn's state of mind throughout is what we're diving into. I mean, from the very first opening scene, we've got um, this woman that they're trying to fix him up with and he kicks her and you're supposed to completely sympathize with him for doing the antisocial but completely appropriate thing of like, I do not want this. This person is disgusting. Get her away from me. And I feel like as a woman, I really appreciated that moment because so infrequently are you, are you allowed to see moments like that play out uh, mm. without going too over the top in the misogyny direction. But that was perfect in terms of everyone's been in that state of mind where someone tried to fix you up and it was terrible and you just wanted a way out. And I feel like that anecdote sets you up to have an affection for Bjorn's antisocial ways in a way that you wouldn't have with any other opening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree on the Bjorn, but Sven is, is an interesting character as well. Because uh, as sympathetic as Bjorn is, uh, Sven is the very opposite, and it's just an oddball couple, really. Oh, yeah, but the, the question, particularly with it being a, a comedy, is, you know, Sven is, is kind of a terrible person, but is he going to be a Basil Fawlty kind of terrible person, or is he going to be a Jeffrey Dahmer kind of terrible person? You know, that's that's the balance with a lot of black comedies, is his awfulness something that I can relate to or connect with in any way? And I think for most of it, yeah, you know, you recognise his foibles, but you recognise that apart from the major one of, of being a, a multiple murderer, they are very ordinary human foibles. Yeah, and his characterization of how he keeps on murdering people, it's like, uh-oh, I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> just... <laughs> I may have comedy. gone a bit too far this time. I, I, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> which I found funny. You know, uh, Mads Mikkelsen does very well with that, I think. I'm starting to find it a lot more funny sort of recounting it and talking back to it than I did watching it. And I wonder whether maybe part of the thing is that, for me, a lot of what I find funny is verbal. So subtitled comedies in a language I don't uh, speak have okay. a bit of a, a problem to start with. But, you know, I have... There are subtitled films that I find very funny. Uh, it's just that this didn't click oh, personally. No. You set that up now. Go on then. Prove it. Which ones? <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, uh, at the moment, I'm uh, probably just as this goes out, the article will have been published, but I've got a huge box set of Lucas Moodison films, uh, and I have never not been, like, in stitches watching We Are The Best. I just yes. think that's... Such I love a that funny film, film so much. So hard to find as well, you know. That's oh, not for man. long. If you could afford to remortgage your home to afford this entire seven-film box set of Lucas Moodison films, and why shouldn't you? Uh, you you can own it forever on Blu-ray. Hmm. Any closing thoughts on uh, the Green Butchers from either of you? I am fascinated by how this film dealt with gore because I think that's always kind of. That's a question that every horror comedy, and I suppose this is tangentially horror comedy, even if I don't think it's interested that much in the horror part, but any black comedy has to find a new route through that thicket, don't they? How do we make graphic violence into something that doesn't kill the mood in a comedy? And I just think it's fascinating how matter-of-fact the gore is here, that when you, on the rare occasions when you do see mm -hmm. butchered bodies, they are just hung up like any other side of meat, and the camera just sort of skirts past them matter-of-factly. I don't think I've ever seen that before. Yeah, it's almost like the use of echoclema in the Greek theatre, like um, using the freezer as like this staged place where, you know, okay, they go in the freezer and then therefore um, I am I have no agency in this death at all. 
Mm. Um, because the thing in Greek theater was that you were never allowed to show killing on stage. And so the Ekeklema was the cart that you wheeled out to show the dead bodies. Ah. And so it's the same idea of like, open the freezer door and it's like the Ekeklema. There are the dead bodies. Hey. But, you know, the agency is not there that shows the actual act of killing. And so the act of killing itself becomes part of the staginess of the event. And, mm. you know, and then when you see the hand go into the bone grinder, it's it's so matter of fact. It's so like, mm. oh, it's just there. I'll throw it in. Um, and, yeah. you know, uh, you can say that in an, in an objective fashion, it is not necessarily gorier or more graphic than any of the animal carcasses. Mm -hmm. that we see slung up in there. It's just that mm -hmm. this one's got a human arm attached to it. Yeah, yeah it's like a similar, well, not really similar, but I think it was Estonian film from a few years ago. I know Graham's a big fan of it, uh, On Body and Soul. It's mm. a yeah, yeah. One, yes, yeah. Love wonderful, that wonderful film. film. But there's, there's, it's set in an abattoir, and there's scenes in the abattoir where I've seen all sorts of horror movies, but any scene set in an abattoir, I'm poking through my fingers because it's just, mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't handle it. Yeah. But, to be so glib about it in this. It, it's kind of funny in, in itself, I think, really. Uh, off colour, uh, however you want to characterise it or uh, mm. regard it. And then you also see it, though, from Igil's eyes as they're throwing away these chicken remains, etc. Mm. And the horror of the fact that these bodies are being disposed so carelessly. And then I'm going to go bury them in the graveyard. Like that juxtaposition is. A really interesting one, too. Could you say it's almost a vegetarian stance this movie's taken, or at least it's uh, <laughs> aware of it, oh, it's given very that aware. sort of voice? It's very aware, I would say. Yeah, because you don't often see that in movies set about uh, the, the meat industries. Well, you uh, see I, it in Okja. Yeah. I mean, Bong Joon Ho's Okja was a perfect example of that, um, I would say, that did it better. But it was also a lot darker. So that it was. Uh, Ariel, any anything left about uh, the Green Butchers? I think to bring up. I think primarily for me, um, it, it's really the story of this friendship between two very antisocial men who, you know, are you know not really listening to each other for various different reasons, and uh, you know what that reeks in their lives alternatively hmm. yeah, there's a, a film which has got a lot of uh, end of year acclaim it's on a similar theme the things that happen if two men just sat down and talked to each other uh -huh. the, the ballad of inisher in it's yeah. 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 yeah yeah but nobody's hand gets mutilated well yes kind yes, of they, yes they do <laughs> <laughs> just not one that's connected <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that leads us into who we're going to be doing in an upcoming episode. So we have 459 podcasters, well, movies, and a cat. <laughs> <laughs> The cat says hello. Hello. <laughs> and we all say hello, kitty. I mean, how can you upstage by a cat? I mean, it's just life in general, really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, we always have to bow down to our feline overlords. <laughs> okay. So, of the 459, the one we'll be doing in an upcoming episode is 220. That's 220. Who is a Czech new wave, and I don't know whether I'm going to get a wave of um, nonplussed faces here, but Jirash Hertz. Ah, mm. yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that one, uh, I very rarely watch anything else. Is is that the, the I woke up and was burned by a cup of tea, or whatever the name of that film is? 
<laughs> Tomorrow I'll wake up and scold myself with tea. If you haven't yes. seen that, by the way, do watch it. It's what? It's, it's the wildest <laughs> Czech time traveling comedy about holidays in through time and Hitler that you'll ever see. So Sold. Speaking of time travel comedies, that that topic will come up again in just a minute. I think this yeah. is very true. It will indeed. Um, Judas Schertz is one of the. I think he's got sort of crossover appeal. He's. I mean, if, if you've not seen it, I think everybody should see The Cremator. That is a a haunting, uh, haunting film. You will never ever forget that. I've heard that yeah. one. Yeah. Um, he's the Morgiana, which is also a very good movie. He's done a version of oh. uh, Beauty and the Beast, which it wasn't. It's, I mean, usually it's like a what is like a bear sort of cat thing, isn't it? Usually in adaptations mm. of that. Yeah. yeah. But in that one, it's got a bird head. So, yeah. Sure. He's got interesting stuff there, so mm. I'm the only one who has a horse in this race, so <laughs> that's, that is fine. I don't have a trigger. That's just it is, really. But I do recommend, if you've not seen The Cremator, uh, do check that out, because, yeah, it's amazing. I've seen The Cremator, and you are 100% correct. It's wonderful. M.T. is an old model, and it consists of a outtrekker house with a bag, a bag, a bag, a bag, a bag, Optisk sigte, bundstykke, slagbold, lavet håndtag og magasin. Vi starter med at placere puffer i fjeder. Jeg har ikke fået den her. Nej, det er nok heller ikke let for dig, kan jeg se. Så prøv lige at starte med at putte fjeder ind i kolben. So that brings us to the second film of the night, the much more contemporary Riders of Justice. Who wants to take a swing at this synopsis? I'll go ahead. I actually did prepare this synopsis, so hopefully okay. I'll do it justice. But uh, Mads Mikkelsen plays Marcus, a veteran soldier from a- Afghanistan who returns home to take care of his daughter um, after uh, his wife dies in a horrible train accident. Um, on his return, though, he has an unexpected encounter with Nikolai Lyakas, Uh, who plays Otto, one of the few survivors of the accident, who's convinced that there's more to this tragedy than than everyone suspects. And indeed, there seem to be many secrets that are hidden. And so now, uh, lethally dangerous at this point, Marcus has no other choice but to delve deep into the mind-boggling world of possibilities to get answers to his unspoken questions, teaming up with statisticians and turning to ultra-violence, trying to make sense of death. Hmm. Uh, Graham, this is a first-time watch for you. Um, yes. What was your feelings on it? Well, uh, th- this is why I hoped we'd do them in this order, because there's a redemption arc here. After bouncing <laughs> okay. pretty hard off the Green Butchers, I really, really enjoyed this. Uh, I- oh, good. I think this is fascinating, and, and part of the joy of it is when you look at how it's marketed, and the poster really does look like this is just going to be like taken with Mads Mikkelsen. Yep, yep. It is going very hard for that, and and the first few scenes, yeah, they they make you think that maybe that's what it's going for, and then it goes into a business meeting about statistics. And this is the kind of tonal pushing, the kind of tonal variance that uh, I was talking about uh, feeling that the Green Butchers lacked. Because every time you feel like you've got a bead on what kind of movie this is, something happens that is impossible to assimilate into any generic version of what this movie could be. And... It's funny that we were talking about the Banshees of Inisherin before, because in in one sense, this is a movie about men's mental health. This is about how, as the meme goes, men would literally rather track down and execute the Riders of Justice criminal biker gang rather than go to therapy. (laughs) And I found it funny. I found it surprisingly tense. I found it extremely surprisingly relatable and emotional. Uh, I think there's just so much good in this movie. I really enjoyed it. Excellent. Ariel? So I will confess, the first time I saw this movie, I did not love it. Because Ah. I was totally expecting something like what you were describing there. And when it got super goofy at times, I was like, this just doesn't, doesn't work. This doesn't jive. I don't get it. 
And what's weird is that actually talking to Anders Thomas Jensen about his vision for the film, you know, he actually talked about the fact that uh, he wanted to have a sense of chaos theory, basically, in that ending, Um, not to give huge spoilers, but um, the final sequence of the shot gives a sense of almost like in Kieslowski's blind chance that that things could go a completely different way if, you know, this one element happened to be in a different place Mm. at a certain time. And one thing that really stuck with me when I went back to rewatch the film was how, um, how differently he's playing with that in a comic way. Whereas you have people like Gaspar Noé who in irreversible plays that a completely different direction. um, Yes. As you could say, but I do think that uh, the tonality of this film is what makes it good. I I really feel like the fact that it is able to switch through so many different genres throughout mm. the life of the film and do so with credible performances, I think that's the real strength of this film. Yeah. I think there there are a lot of movies that have a certain ambiguity to them around nowadays, but they tend to save it for the ending. You know, the idea is that you you walk out having the conversation and asking the questions. But Writers of Justice is interesting because it places a big plot point that will be a matter of taste and which people will not see in the same way right at the start and I think that controls how you view the rest of the movie like for me one of the things that keyed me into it is that I thought Otto's theory that the train accident that kills Max's wife was a deliberate assassination was obviously bunk. I thought that the stats scene at the start was meant to quote him as a very unreliable narrator. Mm -hmm. Now, some people haven't. And I think if you... If you view it that way, you can ride with it, no pun intended, a bit further as a potential kind of revenge action movie until you start to meet some of the other characters and you realise it's going its own way. For me, the fact that I thought Otto was full of crap pretty (laughs) much throughout... Maybe there's there's something sort of funny about that, but there's also something really tragic. You were watching someone dig themselves deeper and deeper into a delusion, and it felt topical. You know, a, a lot of people now were digging themselves further and further into their own bubbles and their own curated kind of delusional worlds, and it reminded me a lot of. There's a great John Ronson radio show. We were talking earlier about Okia, which Ronson uh, wrote. But there's a great radio show he did where he meets people who survived the 7-7 bombings in London. And afterwards, they found a group of conspiracy theorists who were saying, oh, it was... Uh, I think some of them believed that it was like a, a power surge that they said was a terrorist attack so they could get a better insurance payout. Others believed it was the security services, uh, as is inevitable. Um, But it's just that when I listened to that show, I got the sense that it doesn't matter whether you're wrong or you're right about this. What made the situation awful is that everyone was just digging themselves further and further in. And the more they discussed it, the less there was any possibility that there'd be any kind of meeting in the middle. And the, obviously the opening train bombing put me in mind of that and Rides of Justice. But I think the, the story itself plays out in a similar way. You know, For me, I was watching people go further and further down this rabbit hole that just could not end positively. Yeah. And, and in mm. America, that reads very differently because of everything with QAnon that's happened mm. in our country where, you know, so many people who otherwise seem like reasonable people will adopt these very unreasonable positions Mm -hmm. um, in the pursuit of some conspiracy theory. And there's a really wonderful, um, 
a comic book out there about this called Department of Truth um, from James Tinian the Fourth that I highly recommend for anyone who's listening to this, mm-hmm. um, just because mm-hmm. it does such a fantastic job of talking about conspiracy theories and making it dramatic and beautiful. But, but yeah. Wow, that's that's blown me out of the water. Because honestly, <laughs> when I watched it, I sort of took him at face value. I never really took a stance either way of what there was any truth in his theory or not. I just took it as it is what it is. But um, what it is, is I think one of the more interesting examples of uh, grief cinema. Mm. It, it's become very common in a lot of genre movies to use grief as a metaphor for so many things. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I find them very one dimensional. Mm. Um, it's a topic worth discussing by all means, but it's just the execution of them I find lacking when it's so similar across the board. And this for me feels like such a breath of fresh air because it, it kind of taps into the chaos of grief mm. in a way, which very, very few films actually do. There's no one way you react when you're grieving for somebody. It's, it's insane. The things it does to your brain. Um, yeah. And this movie gets it, it, it crosses the spectrum because there's a relationship that uh, Mads Mikkelsen has with these men. He's, you know, r- running out this sort of power fantasy to just find justice. But at the other end of that, there's a relationship he has with his daughter. This relationship where he's, he's just a bad dad, I think is the, the best way to really uh, sum it up. Not a Disney bad dad, but he's a bad dad. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, yeah, and I think that's interesting, isn't it? That he he wants to defend his family, and that's his motivation. But he wants to defend them on the level on this kind of fantasy action hero level, rather than engaging with what his daughter actually needs right now. It's a much more realistic depiction of what that grief is like for most people, because so many of us would rather do anything than actually communicate. Mm-hmm. Like communication is the worst possible thing you could ever be forced to do when you are grieving and being forced to confront your own feelings. I, and that's that's another message that I really love about this film. And that was something I did love about it the first time I watched it. Um, but I still, you know, didn't understand the film and I didn't quite attach to it until... I watched it a second time, but you know, marketing can be very powerful like that, especially when it's so horribly wrong as it was for this. Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I I think it's almost part of the joke now because we're looking at these films from two thousand and three and twenty twenty, and of course, one of the things that has happened in between is that you know. Goofy Mads with his silly hair from the Green Butchers is now an internationally famous actor who is in loads of massive Hollywood franchises. And I think there's an element of Riders of Justice of of playing with this, of Jensen saying, I'm going to make the kind of movie I make with Mads Mikkelsen, which is really tonally all over the map and very silly. But I'm going to sell it like the movie they expect Mads to make. Hmm. I hope that's the case. I really do. But uh, I, w- I will just add this. I was honestly surprised at how well shot it is as an action movie. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is ostensibly a comedy director. He-, he does very dark comedies, but it's a comedy director. And the set pieces are littered throughout it, from the, the train uh, incident at the beginning to these scenes where he's running and gunning with this <laughs> group of very undertrained um assistance uh it's all beautifully shot and beautifully well made there's so many um action directors which i think the problem with a lot of action is you don't know what's happening and where because they're overcut they're over edited Mm -hmm. you don't know the layout of the scene where people are supposed to be but he shot it with such wonderful simplicity that Mm -hmm. you could have a second calling as an action director i honestly believe yeah I mean, you can actually, this is my big beef with most action directors too, Rob. Like I very frequently complain about not being able to visually parse what's happening. And if Mm -hmm. I can't parse what's happening, I just don't care. And my brain turns off. And so I absolutely love the way that these sequences are so perfectly choreographed and they're edited in a legible way 
that actually keeps the audience with you at all times. And I think that's really admirable for someone who hasn't really cut his teeth on a lot of action material. So, Hmm. It's we referenced it earlier, but taken the infamous shot of Liam Neeson jumping over a fence with thirteen cuts, I think was the, <laughs> the legend. But yeah, this is just so so well done as an action movie, I think. But it's it's just one of its many strings. Completely, yeah. I think by the time you've got Nicholas Bro coming into it as Emma and Tyler, you know what kind of movie this is going to be. You know there's going to be this other strain to it that isn't straight action, and I love his performance. He's he's one of cinema's great swearers, isn't he? He is. <laughs> wow, what a claim of fame. <laughs> it, it's something I always value. I think there's there's an art to it like anything else. I, I would put him up there with, yeah, Peter Capaldi, Richard E. Mm-hmm. Grant, and with Neil and I. <sighs> That kind of... Uh... He's still my beating heart. Oh, my God. Malcolm Tucker does it for me every time. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, totally. Hmm. The group of uh, coders, hackers, analysts, I think that's such a, a really nice way of grounding this film, I think. Mm-hmm. Because it's, it's like a men's social club, isn't it? Oh, They're yeah. doing and something I'm, quite I'm, extreme. But and on it's one just... level, you've got that, what was it, the NCIS episode where it says, oh, no, we've got a hack faster, and it's got two of them on the keyboard <laughs> typing as fast <laughs> as they can, which, if that's not a meme, it really has to be. And is at this end of the level, I think there's a, a little throwaway line where it says, can you do that without being noticed? Yeah. <laughs> and he just there. Uh, laughs at him and it's it's that sort of uh, it's making it real these sort of jobs and i think so much of cinema just doesn't get what computers do it doesn't understand <laughs> computers and the, yeah i think these characters actually they're more believable they're more grounded because the, the the writer actually understands what these people are yes beyond like the emotional hook it's not just saying the because so many scripts it's like oh he's he works at an office what's his job he's an office man he does reports. Yes, <laughs> yeah. seen a few of those. So this, this, I think, it really helps ground it. I think in a way which few writer directors actually bother with, honestly. Mm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It does so many things, and sometimes that can be a recipe for disaster. But I think if you're interested in any one of the strands that we've mentioned, that strand will enrich the other ones for you. Like. I'm not sure I would have watched this movie if it was just Mads Mikkelsen going around beating up bikers. I love Mads Mikkelsen, but I feel like I've <laughs> yeah. seen enough of those movies to last me a lifetime. But the other things in it just make it so much richer and more interesting, I think. Yes, yes, they do. Is there anything else that you'd like to bring up, either of you, uh, Graham, uh, Ariel? Anything we haven't mentioned about Riders of Justice? I think... You know, the supporting cast in this really deserves a huge round of applause in general because they are so phenomenal at really playing a beautiful counterpoint to a very serious performance from Mads Mikkelsen, but they they bring so much to the table and it's really just so delightful. I know we've we've called out a couple of people specifically, but but honestly, like I, I just am so impressed with the casting in this film as a whole Hmm. i'd just like to say that uh we haven't mentioned that this is also kind of a christmas movie yep it is a christmas movie yeah my heart is not the only one (laughs) Yes, I watched it on January the 6th which was good because i'd have to pack it away if it was any later than that yeah i never thought about that (laughs) it just kind of it happens and it's just a thing in the background yeah. It doesn't address it, which is the whole thing with Die Hard, isn't it? It just needs to go away, that discussion. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, really good movie. But I think we'll wrap up by talking about the director a bit. What were our, um, Ariel, what were our feelings on uh, Anders Thomas Jensen, his future? Because he is still, he's got a lot of runway ahead of him. Yeah, he's he's got a lot going on in general. And uh, when I look at IMDb and his upcoming projects, it seems like there's quite a lot uh, that's still happening um, in his career. And, you know, what's really interesting, too, is that uh, they're also remaking Writers of Justice for an American version. 
if Ooh. you can believe that, that's in development right now. So I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, well, I, no, I know how I feel about that. I'm pretty <laughs> betrayed and uh, angry at my country that feels like it can remake everything and people can't read subtitles. Oh my mm -hmm. God, I get so angry. But um, but I do think Anders Thomas Jensen, um, if he is in fact going to be directing this American remake um, is probably going to bring a lot of interesting humor to it that uh, hopefully will make him more of a mainstay in uh, people's homes hmm. and minds going forward. Yeah, it's it's interesting because like I say, I, I didn't get on with one of the films we've done today, but I am still curious to see more. And I think it's entirely possible that there'll be an Anders Thomas Jensen film I see that decodes so much of what he's about that I can go back to the Green Butchers and say, ah, I really like this now. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd like to keep on watching his stuff. I'd, really, I'd still really like to see Men and Chicken. Can it possibly be like Aiden said it was? I don't know. Yeah, he, he loved it. It was one of his movies of that year. I uh, found was. it very, very funny. Um, but I just like what he represents for Mads Mikkelsen, really. Mm. Um, I like these little symbiotic actor-director relationships. There is a few of them. I'm not going to be confident enough to reference any of them right now because I've not got any uh, to mind. But just the this... classic ones, Scorsese, De Niro, right? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. But it's this one director where an actor always feels at home, where this actor can really mm -hmm. challenge mm -hmm. themselves and do some roles, which I don't think the wider film community would really buy them in. But essentially, yeah, a relationship like Robert De Niro and um, Scorsese, where this actor can try some real different things because I don't think there's any director confident enough to pitch that sort of green butcher's role or the role that he plays in Men and Chicken. Mm. It's a director he can feel at home and really stretch himself. And I really, really love those little relationships that you get through uh, cinema. I think uh, Kang Ho Song and Park Chan Wook, they have oh. a long history of working together as well. It's just, yeah. And if their relationship continues to grow, I think it's just a little bit of a a wonderful side project that just sort of uh, it carries throughout both of their careers. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's particularly important when it's an actor from a non-English speaking country and a, a director from that country as well, because Mickelson's played some very good roles in America, but when you're a, a sort of tall, handsome European going to Hollywood, a lot of people will want you to play Bond villains. Oh, he's played one of those. A lot of people will want you to play like a Marvel villain. Oh, he's played one of those. So it's very important that there's always someone you can go back home to who will see you in, in an entirely different context. And yeah, it, it doesn't get much more of a different context than this, I think. Absolutely yeah. agreed. Any director who asks you to cut your hair like that, they're, they're <laughs> confident. Just for the reference, he basically has like the entire front third of his hair shaved off. So it's yes. just, I don't know how. But he the, does the it back, it. the back two thirds is fulsome. The back two thirds yeah. is like the golem yeah. of Prague. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, I think that covers it really. Unless there's anything else anybody wants to talk about with Anders Thomas Jensen, are we I all? Think that's that's covered all, it for me. I think, I think we've got done. it. Oh. Excellent, excellent. So, um, Ariel, where can we find you and your work across the internet? Well, I am uh, a filmmaker, podcaster. My podcast, Ride the Omnibus, is available on all the usual places and so forth. Um, you can find me at arielbasca.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram as just ask a Basca, and Twitter as ruin my sky. So, uh, feel free to look me up on any of the things I'm involved in a lot of projects on disability and horror right now. So if that floats your boat, come check it out. Hmm. Graham. I'm on uh, Twitter and Instagram at Graham W film. I'm on letterboxd the essential social networking site if we're honest just as graham williamson uh, you can also often find my writing in byline times we are cult the geek show of course uh, and i'm host of the geek shows podcast pop screen 
where we take a different movie, either starring or about a pop star every week, and ascertain whether or not it is any good. Um, what uh, movie music combos have you got coming up? Uh, so we're going into February, aren't we? Uh, we're definitely doing Dance Craze, which is a really great concert film about first wave of ska in Britain, uh, which oh. Mick and I will be doing, of course, because Teddy Hall of the specials died at the end of last yeah. year, and we we just wanted a vent to talk about how incredible Teddy Hall was. Um, I've recorded, I don't know if it'll be coming out next month or the month after I've recorded uh, an episode with Aiden on a gunfight, a low budget 70s western with the uh, I think slightly mismatched but really interesting central duo of Kirk Douglas and Johnny Cash Wow (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So there's there's lots of fun stuff coming up Excellent, and uh, I have been your host, uh, Rob. You can find me across the social medias at Uncut Robcast. There's too many social media platforms now. I'll be honest, everybody's running scared for Elon doing whatever he's going to do at Twitter. And um, yes, yeah. circling the carcass of Twitter. <laughs> You can find me across the internet as Uncut Robcast. Um, but yeah, until next time, when we will be doing Juraj Hurst, and I hope we're not watching The Cremator again, because it took me a week to recover <laughs> from that last time. Um, thank you for listening. It's been Directors Uncut.